We're with fellow Palestinian journalist, writer, and foreign policy analyst, Rula Jebrel. Welcome to Turkey. Thank you. Nice to have you in Istanbul. Thank you. Okay, um, you born in Haifa, grew up in Jerusalem, and when people were thinking, used to think about the Middle East, the first thing was the crisis between Palestine and Israel. But right now, when you look at the Middle East, where we, we see the tragedy in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Libya. So, um, is any solution possible in Middle East without resolving Palestinian-Israelian crisis? I think that's that was a question that people keep asking themselves about. Uh, I really believe that there's no way you can have any kind of stability in this region without solving all the compli- all the, the conflicts that are there forever. The Palestinian conflict is one of them. But now we are seeing the main conflict in the whole region is a conflict between the people who want to be part of a democratic system where they are treated as equal, where they want human rights, minority rights, women rights, and basically they want their voice to be heard. They want to choose their representative. They want a democratic system. So the whole Arab Spring is basically the, the premise of the first intifada. What was the first intifada about? I was 16 years old when it started. The whole intifada was, we want dignity, we want social justice, and we want freedom because we are born free. So basically, it's the continuation of the intifada. The intifada that started in 86 is alive and kicking in the streets of Beirut, Damascus, uh, Sana'a, and elsewhere in the region, and in Baghdad. And it will never go away. It can push be pushed down, but it will come back. Why don't we talk about Palestinian crisis anymore? Because basically world powers decided it's a it's a done issue. And I think the government in Israel were very uh, effective in lobbying. And they decided they don't want to take the whole land. But they want the land, they don't want the people. So now, after 9-11, the whole issue of the Palestinian issue became basically an Islamic issue. Muslims and our, you know, the West see Islam as a problem, not radicals, but Muslim in it, the, most, the whole Muslim world. And basically what we've been seeing, this struggle and push, you know, push back against any um, idea that some people deserve equality, freedom, and dignity. And, you know, the whole election of President Trump in America is actually a pushback against that idea, not only for Palestinians, but even for African Americans, for Latino Americans, for any diversity. They view diversity as a threat. That's why you don't hear about the Palestinian issues. Okay, I understand. So let's talk about women in the Middle East, yes. especially Syrian women in refugee camps. So um, almost half of them are kids, especially in Turkey. So. How can we save their future? Look, I, I visited the camps both in Turkey, in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Greece, in um, and in uh, in Italy, in the south. And it's heartbreaking to see that there's no real investment, except rare cases in education. I think your country is doing an exceptional work when it comes to that, especially uh, Gazi Antep and that region. They, but they need help. I mean, it's, they cannot do it alone. It's a huge issue, and it's a permanent issue. It's not, if, if somebody thinks that in two years the whole solution will be like Syria will be stable and they will go back, they're delusional. And we as Palestinians know that very well. It's been 70 years we've been displaced. Uh, but the fact that 50% and even more of them are children, that's a future you need to think about. These people, kids, who are 10 today, in 10 years will be 20. Who do you think they will blame? Who do you think they will go after? Who will exploit them and use them? The radicals who will use them and, and abuse them? And they will be part of that army. But we can preventively intervene there through education, open schools. So if you you don't have to think it's a government issue. If you are uh, a businessman or a businesswoman or have certain activities and you want to give in charity, invest in education. Uh, my favorite French, uh, intellectual used to say, Victor Hugo, when you open a school, you close a jail. He's right. Investing in, in education is the best future we can get. I wouldn't be the woman I am today without an education, without a high education, a school, university, and mentors who help me be the woman I am today. Okay. In Turkey, um, the main question is 
do the government, do the state have to teach Turkish for the refugees or let's teach them Arabic? So Dual language. Okay. Listen, I grew up yeah. learning <laughs> both my language and Hebrew. And today I speak Arabic, Hebrew, Italian and English. Why it has to be binary? Teach. I mean, my, my daughter Mira speaks Spanish. Speak. Uh, she doesn't speak Arabic, which is my failure. Uh, I regret that. Okay. Italian and English. Why do we need to, to choose one or another? Teach them both. Create a bilingual system so it's not difficult to them. And basically teach Turks English and French and other languages. Look, I'm all a proponent of teaching languages, so you're opening a door. A lot of people who grew up in Middle East have fled to to West to get their lives to live there. But is this a big loss for Middle East? Yes. You know, when our intellectuals, uh, I used to hear this sentence in Cairo especially, and uh, the middle, if you're an intellectual in the Middle East, either you have to cease to be an intellectual or cease to be in the Middle East. And it's a tragedy. It's not a joke, actually. So if, you have, if you're scared because of your ideas and you're running off, or you are getting arrested because of your ideas. It's a problem because those ideas actually what makes this nation, any nation, great. It, it's contribute. If you think of your iPhone, we all have iPhones. Where this idea came from? A logarithm, al a Muslim, basically a Muslim scientist. Uh, if you think of Ben Arusha, Ben Sinna, all of these incredible scientists, physicians, they were in, but there was an era in the Muslim world where we invested in science, in art, in philosophy, in, in culture. Why do we, and they weren't scared. You know, Harun al-Rashid was not scared of that. Uh, the Khalifas in Baghdad were not scared of that. They saw it as part of our Islamic duty, basically to expand and open to education. They brought books from China and translated them. Why we're scared of books and intellectuals today? It's because sometimes politicians rather have one idea than multiple ideas and have that idea, but then if you have one idea and you close it down, you can never progress in society. So it's a failure for the Middle East that our intellectuals are living in Paris and London and, and they feel safe there. If you meet someone and if they don't know you, when you say that you are Palestinian, how do they react? Uh, well, I have multiple identities, so I usually when they ask me where I'm from, I have a hard time or where home is. Where home is, or where I feel free, where I feel independent, where I have, uh, where I live in a society that allows me to say what I want to say, even if it's, uh, if it's uncomfortable truths. So when I when they ask me where you where are you from, originally where you come from, I <laughs> I wonder where this question comes from. So I am European in part, I'm Palestinian in part, uh, but I remember the first time I was invited to television. And I was in Italy. In Italy, 27 years old, and I arrived to the television network. I was about to talk about the Second Intifada, and the producer was waiting. Couldn't. It's like, where is this Palestinian journalist? And I was actually sitting there. I said, I think you're talking about me. And he looked at me and said, You, you? And I said, Yes. And he was a Jewish uh, uh, producer, and he said, You're Palestinians. I'm going to convert. But then he told me later that he was thinking that I would be arriving with a veil. So there was all these stereotypes. He thought I would be, you know, shy, I would be arriving with a veil. Actually, at the first time I was on air, there was a minister from uh, Ariel Sharon government, and I, I think I whipped the floor with him. And they liked that they hired me. Do you have any advice for a Turkish woman? I think I need to learn from Turkish women the strength of living in a society that is so polarized like now. Uh, no, no advice except Speak up, continue speaking up, fight for your rights, and don't let any man tell you that your ideas are not valuable. You're powerful because of your ideas. And you own your public space. They don't, it's not, it's not a gift that they are giving you. You own it, and that's yours, so take it. Thank you so much. Thank you.